So have you noticed that for the death of any given Nintendo service, 10 new emulators pop up? When game companies refuse to preserve games, the community is going to do it for them. Even with PlayStation, Sony hasn't made any official app for remote play on the Steam Deck, but once again, the community did it for them, and as many of you already know, the Steam Deck is basically a PlayStation Portal with better remote play than the PlayStation Portal. That's why I am all too happy to celebrate when game companies do, in fact, support the preservations of their games and their online features like Sony has announced they are doing this week. Now, this story is actually going to be a little bit divisive for the PC faithful, so I'm going to present both what is potentially good and what is potentially not so good. And I want you to tell me where you land on this one. So about just one month ago, Sony announced that they were porting Ghost of Tsushima to PC. Naturally, I'm someone that thinks porting to PC is pretty much always a step in the right direction in terms of game preservation. I can easily play 2005 PC games on my PC, but if I wanted to play PlayStation games from 2005, well, that's gonna be quite a bit trickier. So of course, any PC port is a big W, especially when it's headed by Nixus, who have been nearly flawless when it comes to ports on PC including Spider-Man Remastered, Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart, and Horizon Forbidden West. All of those play pretty well on the Steam Deck and on modest PCs for that matter. So that's going to give me hope that Ghost of Tsushima would follow suit. Well, we got the system requirements for Sushi and it seems my hopes were well placed. This game will take up about 75 gigabytes of space on your DeX SSD or your micro SD card, but notably it's going to run 720p at 30 FPS on a GeForce GTX 960. That should give it more than enough headroom to get around 40 FPS on the deck at 800p. Not to mention this game will have support for FSR 3 and Intel XESS, so this is a game that's going to be very accessible to a wide variety of machines. But perhaps more interestingly, this is going to be the first Sony game that supports brand new PlayStation PC features, namely a PlayStation overlay, crossplay, and PlayStation trophies. The overlay will be available by pressing Shift plus F1, which is definitely something you could map using Steam input if you were so inclined. You'll also be able to see and search for friends in addition to seeing your trophy collection and viewing your profile. Ghost of Tsushima's Director's Cut on PC will share the same trophies as the PlayStation version of the game. In fact, Sony confirmed that if you've already unlocked the trophies on PS5, then you will also have them unlocked on your PC when you connect to PSN. Additionally, this port will still have full support for Steam achievements or EGS achievements. I just realized, I don't think I've ever seen an Epic Game Store achievement or what it looks like. Never mind. Finally, you can play the cooperative multiplayer Legends mode of Sushi Online. Crossplay here means that you'll be able to team with players on PC or PlayStation 4 or PS5, so you'll have access to a broad player base. Of course, in order to get access to all of these features, you will need to log into your PlayStation Network account. Thankfully, the use of the overlay is optional, and so I would assume you can play this game normally, at least in single player mode, without ever logging into PSN if you never want to. Ideally, they would even have a launch option for skipping the PS login altogether. That's something you can do for Cyberpunk and Witcher 3 with their launcher called the Red Launcher. You can input a launch option in the game's properties and just never see the launcher at all, which is pretty nice. I think where some people have gotten upset and where some others have gotten excited is the potential for what's next. There are some people that are worried about seeing PlayStation expand their PC suite into an overlay and into logins and expect that Sony is going to make a launcher and they're also immediately jumping to concern that it won't be compatible with the Steam Deck. Then there are others that are looking at the future more optimistically. Some are hoping for cross save as a future feature. I won't even mention the fantasy of cross buy, which would be absolutely amazing, but naturally I just can't imagine that happening. Of course, there are people that take this as a sign that we're closer to day and date releases on PC. All of this is very clearly either wishful thinking or woeful thinking. It's hard to say what direction Sony's going to go in, but the road they've been headed down has been really good to see so far. 
That said, I couldn't really begrudge them if in the future they wanted to create their own PC store. I can't imagine that Sony would be comfortable feeling like their entire PC ecosystem is dependent on Valve, the same way that Valve feared their entire ecosystem was dependent on Windows just 10 years ago. Regardless, Sony has been very supportive of an open PC market, and they've done more than most AAA publishers when it comes to making their games playable on the Steam Deck and other PC handhelds. They clearly care about meeting PC gamers where they are today, so I do have some faith that they'll continue to do so. What do you think? Next up in games I'm excited to play on the Steam Deck, we have Hades 2. Supergiant Games announced that this title is getting close to an early access release, but what's also exciting is that they launched a playtest that anyone on Steam was able to at least request access to. I'm sure there's a high demand and not everyone is getting access, of course. In fact, I haven't even gotten access yet despite mashing the button like me when I'm trying to skip all the dialogue in Hades and get right to bashing on some bad guys. But you know who did get access? Friend of the show, Steam Deck HQ. As of me writing this, Noah's article has not been posted yet, but he did have the following to say. The game runs at 90 FPS with no drops. It runs at under 11 watts battery in all fights and areas so far. It sports the 16 by 10 resolution. The OLED makes colors pop and the gameplay is amazing. You freaking love to see it. That's almost five hours of battery life with no adjustments, which is good because I know some people are gonna have some long ass sessions with this one. If you haven't requested access to this playtest yet, I'll leave a link in the description so you can try your luck. Continuing on the subject of games, we did get news of two more games that should play well on the Steam Deck. One of them is Shin Megami Tensei 5 Vengeance, the enhanced port of the 2021 entry into the SMT series, which originally launched on the Nintendo Switch. For this title, you can see on the Steam page that it has already been rated verified by Valve. This stands in contrast to a couple of weeks ago when I reported that Atlas unfortunately would not be bringing their tactical RPG, Unicorn Overlord, to the PC. If you recall, well, that one was not Atlas's fault. Unfortunately, the development studio Vanillaware was not keen on a PC port and that was part of their publishing agreement with Atlas. Thankfully, we won't have to worry about that with SMT5, which launches on June 14th. Likewise, the studio behind Ori and the Blind Forest, as well as Ori and the Will of the Wisp, has a new upcoming game called No Rest for the Wicked. This is an action RPG with gorgeous visuals that should be available in early access by the time you are watching this video. While it has yet to be rated by Valve, we did get a look at the system requirements, and they once again give the indication that it will run well on the Steam Deck and other PC handhelds. Minimum appears to be 1080p at 30 FPS on a GTX 970. Again, I would expect 800p at 40 FPS to be doable here too, and it's going to be great if we can find our way up to 60 FPS. Thankfully, we're going to be finding out very, very soon. Now, if it's emulation you care about, Retro Deck just received a new update with 0.8.0b. Typically, I feature Emu Deck because that's just what I use, but Retro Deck is a fantastic option for emulation. Everything is contained in one flat pack application, so it makes it easy to install, easy to find your files, and makes it so that you only have one place to back up. In any case, this latest update removes Yuzu in favor of Ryujinx, and it removes Citra in favor of the Citra Core in RetroArch. Importantly, because this is a single all-in-one application, that does mean that you're not going to be able to add Yuzu or Citra back on your own in the way that you theoretically could with other solutions, so that is a drawback to be aware of. Interestingly, I think the post for this update gives good insight into the downstream effects that we've seen since Yuzu and Citra were removed. It opens with saying, quote, as you might have heard, Yuzu and Citra standalone version is no more and anyone supplying Yuzu or Citra is breaking the court settlement and could be targeted for litigation, end quote. And when answering why Citra was affected too, the post has these bullet points. It says, Citra and Yuzu were made by the same company in US. The Yuzu and Citra teams were mostly the same. Yuzu and Citra shared code and in the settlement, both Citra and Yuzu were affected. Finally, the Citra and Yuzu Discord confirmed their shutdown. This definitely goes a long way to explain why even forks of Yuzu, like Suyu, are continuing to find themselves in trouble. 
Most recently, the Discord servers for both Suyu and Sudachi were shut down by Discord themselves. Sean Hollister at The Verge reported that, quote, the developers of Suyu and Sudachi received vague messages about how they were sharing content that allegedly violates intellectual property rights, according to images shared with The Verge. He goes on to say that, meanwhile, Discord tells us that it's following normal processes for DMCA takedown requests, but it's not at all clear that there was a valid DMCA takedown request or that those communities were actually violating IP rights. And it's quite possible Discord isn't following its own policy by kicking them out, end quote. In fact, Sudashi's primary developer, Jared Norwell, said that the first email from Discord claimed that he had broken the TOS, but it gave no additional information. Overall, Sean Hollister reports that rather than following their normal procedure, quote, Discord simply de-platformed these emulators by nuking their communication channels, end quote. So yeah, this is an extremely informative piece that has caused me to rethink my stance on Suyu. Up to this point, I've been extremely skeptical of Suyu because it's forked from Yuzu, which many people have referred to as radioactive. There are reports that Yuzu devs were pirating and some speculation that they even stole code from a leaked Switch SDK. So personally, I was dubious of anything picking back up where Yuzu left off. But this piece from The Verge offers a grounded counter perspective and it seems likely that Nintendo is doing what they often do, using their position of power to bully not just independent hobbyist developers, but also places like Discord and GitLab, basically to just do what Nintendo wants under the threat of litigation. Of course, that is why I am downright ecstatic to see emulators finally return to the Apple App Store. Delta is probably the first one you want to go grab. If you own an iPhone, it supports NES, Super Nintendo, N64, Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, and Nintendo DS. It's a great lineup overall, and it seems like it's time for me to dust off my Backbone controller and try some emulation on my phone. So I watched the Nintendo Indie World and I was happy to see that almost all of the games will be available on the Steam Deck and even a couple of them already were released on Steam. I even made a tweet thread about it so you can reference that if you want to see a Steam page for each of these games. So I'll leave a link to that in the description. The biggest two announcements were Steam World Heist 2 and Yars Rising. Heist 2 is naturally the latest game in the Steam World universe. It's a turn-based tactics game where you plan shots that bounce off walls to hit your ops. All the Steam World games are pretty neat, so I'm looking forward to this one. Yars Rising resurrects the Yars Revenge franchise with a new side-scrolling Metroidvania made by WayForward, who are experts in the genre with games like Shantae and Mummy Demastered. A couple more games to keep your eyes on real quick. There's Anton Blast, but don't call it a Pizza Tower clone. These two games have both been in development for quite some time. Pizza Tower just happened to come out first. They also both take inspiration from Mario Land. Anton Blast has a demo on Steam, so you can check that out right now. Then there's Lorelei and the Laser Eyes, which is published by Annapurna, but being developed by Samogo, who made Sayonara Wild Hearts, The Vice 6, and Year Walk, so they are damn good at video games. S Skim is a really adorable looking adventure game where you navigate the monochrome environment by jumping from shadow to shadow. Anyway, the only two games that don't seem to be coming to Steam yet are Stitch, and TMNT Splintered Fate. Splintered Fate does look like a lot of fun. It's a co-op Hades-like, so it's something that me and my kids would enjoy playing together. In any case, both of these games are originally Apple Arcade exclusives, so that might have something to do with why we don't see them on Steam yet. Not sure, but we'll find out soon. And once again, we have not heard anything about Silk Song. While that is unfortunate, I do feel bad for developers that are just trying to showcase their own indie game during these uh, presentations. These were some awesome looking games, so take a look, maybe wishlist a couple of them, help them out. All right, the last story is a good one. This comes to us courtesy of friend and editor of the show, High Tech Low Life. He tweeted that Asus is now reimbursing anyone whose SD card was damaged in an ROG ally. This is an email that was sent to anyone who R made their ally for SD card related issues. Overall, this is incredible. Huge respect to ASUS for doing this. ASUS has really stuck by the ROG Ally. They've heard the feedback. They made improvements at every turn. And here they are owning their mistake in the best way by reimbursing folks that were impacted. You absolutely love to see it. All right, that's going to do it for today's show. I hope you're having a wonderful week. 
that gang out. Goodbye.